So we're here to talk about community solar gardens. Um, how many of you had heard of community solar gardens before you got your postcard? Ooh, hot dog. How many of you feel like you know kind of what you're wanting to do with a community solar garden, but you're hoping that somehow we will affirm that to you tonight? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good. Um, so let me start by saying, uh, if I am talking and you think, good Lord, slow down, or would you say that again, or what you really forgot to tell me was this other really important thing that you should have mentioned, put your hand up, okay? We'll try to stop. I don't want to take too much time probably throughout just because I want to make sure that Jamie has enough time and we have time for question and answer at the end, but I do want to make sure that I get any clarifying questions that you have as we go. So I will do the very short um, certs sales pitch. That was like my super wonky bio. I realized when someone else reads it that I'm like, oh God, I can't believe I wrote that down. Um, <laughs> so I, I work with certs, um, stands for the Clean Energy Resource Teams, and our mission is actually to connect individuals and their communities to the resources that they need to both identify and implement community scale energy projects. We're focused very much on action. We don't do policy work. Um, we're largely publicly funded and foundation funded, so we're not taking private dollars in case that comes up later as a question. I'm based at the University of Minnesota in um, Extension, but CERTS is actually a partnership. We're not an organization, so we partner with um, the Great Plains Institute, the Minnesota Department of Commerce, which is where the State Energy Office is located, and the Southwest Regional Development Commission. That is my short sales pitch. There you go. Okay, on with the, the real content. Here we go. Community shared solar means the same thing as community solar gardens, also abbreviated as CSS or CSG. Um, people who work in the energy world, it's like we went to camp to try to make everything as complicated as possible and to use as many acronyms to confuse everybody else as we possibly could. And we have been well trained at this and are good at it. Um, so I'm defining that for you now. This is the Cliff Notes version for community solar. It is essentially, like all of us in this room, or all of the people in this photo, all participated in getting this one solar garden all together, and it is as though you could actually point and say, that panel right there is mine, okay? Or you might say that handful of panels is mine. That's essentially what you're doing. It's a, it's a centralized solar system that you can say, I have contributed to that. Uh, how many of you are Xcel Energy customers? <laughs> well, thank goodness. Okay. I mean, it's always good to start with, you know, where are we, right? Um, the prerequisite for being involved in a community solar garden project is that you are an Xcel Energy customer. That's it. That's the only prerequisite in terms of whether or not you can participate. Now, it's going to get more complicated than that as we go, but this is the thing to keep in mind. So if you get an XL Energy bill, this is what we're talking about for you tonight. Why in the world would you want to do this? Well, I mean, honestly, really only you know the answer to that in your head, uh, but when people are putting together the policy for thinking about community solar gardens, one of the reasons that they wanted to do it is that they wanted to democratize who all can be involved in solar? So um, I feel badly for these people on the left. Any of you who have seen me present before, I always use this picture when I'm talking about community solar gardens. Here's the home that did their own solar. And then they learned the first rule of solar, which is <laughs> trees grow. Uh, many of you may have said trees in your yard. And you might think, I like those trees. But it may mean that you don't have a great roof for solar. That is great. That's fine. That's why you have community solar gardens. So that's one reason that people really are excited about this. One of the other things is, um, how many of you know that you're going to live where you currently live for the next 25 years? <laughs> okay, well, a handful of you, um, but the rest of you are like many of the rest of the people in the world who aren't completely sure. And so sometimes you're worried about, do I really want to invest in that solar system on my roof? Will it be a payback? I don't know if I'm going to be there. If I do it now, then I have to move in three years. Or if I live in an apartment and I actually don't own my roof, I'm not allowed to put it up, or any of those sorts of things. Or maybe you just think, I didn't have $30,000 burning a hole in my pocket. How many did you, did anybody want to give me something? I have a, a pocket. Um, but there are a lot of reasons that people are thinking, this might be a good option for me, okay? One of the other things is, as we think about it, um, 
you're always going to get your best solar system where you have your best solar resource. And even if you have a roof that might have some good solar resource, people really want to look at the ideal solar resource locations. This is a this is a map app. You can actually this is the web address. You can get on here, enter in your address, and this thing will zoom into your home business congregation, whatever, and you can look at, do I have a good solar resource? You can actually click on your roof in little different spots and it'll tell you, do you have a good solar resource? Yes? It's hard to read the yellow. Sure enough. It says, it says solar.maps.umn.edu forward slash app, and we can send these slides out afterward, I suspect, to folks, or you can come up and talk to me and I'll give it to you. Um, but the, one of the things with solar gardens is people are saying, we can put this in the perfect ideal locations for solar, right? Because that's where they're trying to, developers are going to be part of this story, and they're trying to put these gardens where they get the best solar resource. Okay, so how many of you went to presentation school? Go back this way. No, go back. <laughs> I didn't type it in fast enough, sorry. The web address. Here you go. Thanks. There you go. Okay, so um, how many of you went to presentation school where they told you to tell people things three times for them to remember it? <laughs> Okay, so we all went to the same school. People are still typing. We'll come back to it, folks, okay? I promise, we'll come back there. Okay, um, here's another definition of community solar gardens. Um, we actually have a fact sheet that we put up on our website that you can all download, and I'll give you that web address later. But this is sort of our central definition of what a community solar garden is, okay? So it says, number one, solar panels, PV stands for photovoltaic. They're installed in sunny locations to produce renewable electricity. That seems straightforward. Number two, individual entities, that's you, subscribe. And you can subscribe to enough solar to cover up to 120% of your annual electric usage. More or less what that's saying is you can subscribe to enough solar to cover all of your electric needs. And you could even go a little bit higher than that, just to make sure, just in case you installed an extra energy-consuming bulb or something. Not that you would do that. Um, and then what's going to happen is you're going to get a credit on your utility bill for your share of that system's output. So do you remember at the very beginning when I showed you that Cliff Notes one, and I said, you can actually look up and you can say, that one panel, that's the one that I'm a part of? What you're going to get on your bill is credit for what that one panel would have generated or your share of that whole garden. So that's going to be on your utility bill from your existing utility. That's how that's going to work. Okay, since we're all in Excel territory, these are the general numbers. Um, how many of you have read an article about community solar gardens in the newspaper? Okay. How many of you have thought, hmm, that's confusing. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think that almost every time. So here's, it, this is what the statute says. This is what state law says. Each garden can have, each single garden, and we can talk about this a little bit, can have a maximum size of one megawatt. That's a big number. That may not mean anything to you. But in um, 2013, when Minnesota signed this law, we had 14 megawatts total of installed solar capacity in our state. Minnesota passed a state energy standard for the investor-owned utilities, which includes Excel, that they had to get 1.5% of their energy resources from solar. That would be 400 megawatts. 1.5% would be 400 megawatts of solar. So that's a big jump, 14 to 400. So each of these individual gardens can be one megawatt. They can be co-located with one another for those who have applied into the program early, up to five megawatts. You have to have, each garden has to have five subscribers. A subscriber could be Hennepin County. A subscriber could be Butch. <laughs> um, it can go anywhere in the range of that, but you have to have five subscribers to your garden. No subscriber can take more than 40% of the output of the garden. So I suspect that Hennepin County uses more energy than Butch. Um, but if they were in a garden together, Hennepin County still couldn't have more than 40% of the output of that garden. So you'd have to make up the rest of it with other subscribers. And then, of course, that whole reference to you can only uh, cover a certain percentage of your usage. 
Okay, here's the other prerequisite. So you have a utility bill. The other prerequisite is about location, location, location. Uh, how many of you live in Hennepin County? <laughs> okay, good. So here you are. You can subscribe to gardens that are in Hennepin County or any adjacent county to you. I guess you'd have to sort of roll the dice with Sherburn. I mean, I guess if it touches, maybe you could participate with them. But um, if there are gardens in Stearns, or if there are gardens in McLeod, or gardens in Lesseur, those are not gardens that you can participate in. So when you're looking at gardens that you might want to participate in, you need to make sure that they're either in Hennepin County or an adjacent county. Otherwise, you're not eligible, and when you try to subscribe to those, your subscription will get kicked back. Okay? Is there a rationale behind the law that says because we have the population concentrated in the Twin Cities, which would infer that we would get the most subscribers here, are we going to cluster all our panels nearby? I think the rationale behind the law was that these were going to be community-based systems and that they would be, that the idea was that people would want to be able to bike by them or drive by them or see them in and around their community. Um, and so people wanted to have this more personal connection to that energy production, and so they wanted it to be located kind of nearby, I think is the rationale. Yes? But it's also about distribution of power, too, right? I mean, it's more complicated to produce it way across the state. It is absolutely more complicated, and it's beneficial to the grid to have it dispersed around. He asked for the rationale. Um, and I was describing what I thought the rationale was, not necessarily sort of some of the other benefits, but that's why. Um, again, it's designed to cover usage. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, except to sort of describe this. Okay, so when you sign up, um, you can sign up for as little as a 200 watt by statute. It depends on what the garden operators offer you. But you can sign up for a little chunk of solar. You don't have to get all of your energy use, or even half of your energy use covered, you're, you can subscribe to the amount that works for you. So I want you to just keep that in mind. You don't have to go all of your energy use right away. Maybe you've been covered this, but is there some kind of answer about how long it would take you to bring back your investment? Yes, we'll get to a little cut later. Okay. Um, but just keep in mind, I don't know how, I don't know how you all use energy, but the average home uses about 800 kilowatt hours a month and four kilowatts could cover, for that kind of home, would cover about half of your energy needs. Now, how many of you um, still have incandescent bulbs? I know, it's kind of embarrassing to raise your hands. <laughs> um, so I always, I'm a big believer in the bait and switch, come to hear about solar and um, have people hammer you over the head with efficiency. Um, soon it will be harder to buy those bulbs. It is already harder to buy those bulbs. And I would encourage you to do energy efficiency first, always. It is always cheaper than anything else you're going to do. Lessen your energy usage and then size everything else appropriately. That was my one soapbox thing. I'll get off of it now. Um, okay, so here's how it works. Uh, this is an important detail. Here are you. Uh, you're the subscriber. You have an ongoing relationship with your utility. Your utility is how you would get your bill credit. That's where you would get that credit back from. But you now also have a separate relationship with this garden operator or garden developer. They're the ones who are building these projects. So someone early on said, well, is that another, it's another business. Is this another provider? Yeah, this is another business. These are not nonprofits. Um, they're, they're also um, trying to make a living and they're making a living with solar. But you're going to now have two different relationships. Yes? It's also Excel, though, for any that time. It's also Excel? Yeah, because Excel Image Program. So does that mean that other provider is also Excel? Uh, this is differentiating between Excel Energy and cooperative utilities or municipal utilities or other investor-owned utilities. Minnesota has over 180 electric utilities. Even I bet. they're called Excel. No, they're not called Excel. Excel just serves the Twin Cities. Okay. I give lots of presentations and this is one of those things where I'm giving it so people know this is the model that applies to you right so you're in Excel territory this is the model that applies to you this is the this is a header okay your utility is Excel this operator could be any number of companies and I'm going to go through some of those companies but you now have it's a triangle you have two different relationships and you're making a long-term decision if you work on a community solar garden to have a long-term relationship with yet another power provider. I mean, that's essentially what that is. So you need to keep that in mind. You're now getting your energy 
essentially from two different people. And that's an important, it's an important change for you to understand as you go into this relationship. Because it really is a relationship. Some of you have already been thinking about the money part of it. Um, these are the credits that you would get for your share of the system output. Now I'm going to walk you through this, and we have all of this on our website, and we can get you this information, so don't be furious scribbling. I know it's going to get complicated fast. Okay, um, many, I'm going to assume that most of you are here as a residential customer. So here you are, residential. So when you sign up and you get a credit on your bill, your credit will be at a minimum of 12 cents per kilowatt hour produced by your share of the garden. Okay? You're going to get paid back that much. If your garden operator chooses to sell what are called RECs, or renewable energy credits, that's like the green attribute of the power, okay? If they sell those, and most of them likely will, you'll get an extra two cents. If it's a bigger garden, and bigger means more than 250 kilowatts, you'll get three cents if it's a smaller garden. Please don't feel compelled to have to memorize this right now. It's okay. You're all like, oh God, she put a table up there. I feel that way too sometimes. Um, here's, so that's how the credit part will work. If you subscribe, there are going to be two models that you can generally use to pay for your subscription. So the credit part was that relationship with the utility, you and the utility, the XL Energy, they're going to give you the credit. The other relationship that you have is with this developer or operator, and there are two options. One option is you pay up front, which I depict with my stack of cash. Like you pay, I'm going to pay Lee right now, you know, like here's my $1,100. Um, maybe. Um, and then I would get the credits on my bill every month for the next 25 years. Okay? That's the pay up front. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to fall. <laughs> okay. Um, pay with the house? Uh, you can sell it and you can transfer it. And those are important questions to ask. It doesn't necessarily have to stay with the house. And if you move within Hennepin County and you're still an XL Energy customer or adjacent county to where your garden is, you can take your subscription with you. Mm. Oh, oh. Hey, that's good. Um, okay, so pay as you go. I mean, some of these definitions are pretty intuitive. <laughs> Instead of giving Lee $1,100 at the beginning, it might be that I'm paying Lee, say, $20 a month, every month, and then I get a credit the next month on my bill. And so I keep paying Lee 20 bucks every month over the period of 25 years. Go ahead. So when I'm paying it over time, am I paying more than if I paid Lee up front? Um, it's a good question, and um, I would say generally yes. Typically, because if you do a pay-as-you-go model, there will be what is called an escalator on your subscription, okay? So think about an interest rate, right? So Lee loves it if you pay him up front, and you'll be better off at the end, probably financially, if all goes well, but there are risk factors in here, okay? So it's depending on how you want to spend that. But there may be an escalator, and that's one of those things that there might be and there might not be, but likely for a residential subscription, you're going to have an escalator. And so it's going to tell you at the beginning, you can pay this much, and that rate will go up, say, 2% or 2.5% per year over time. Is that? Okay, so you're all like, okay, but is this really a good idea? Um, so it's, you have to decide that for yourself, I guess, is the short answer. Um, but one of the things that people talk to us a lot about is um, how are the economics going to shake out? Um, that's what a lot of people care about. So we've developed a couple of calculator tools that you can actually play with on our website. And you can go in and you can enter in what's your desired subscription in kilowatt hours per month. So I just use the 800 number for that average residential customer. And then what's the rate that you're going to get paid, the applicable retail rate? That was that first number in that table, that 12 cents number. Remember that? And so there's actually a pick list. You just pick the number because it picks by class. You enter in how much that renewable energy credit is. And then here's the, here's the meat of it. 
you don't really get to adjust that stuff much. So it says, what is the escalation offered to the subscriber by the CSG? Of course we made it as wonky as we possibly could. Um, but what that's saying is, what escalator did that company offer you? Did they give you 2%, 2.5%, 2.75%, 4%, whatever that is, you plug that in. You plug in, this is actually a calculated number, this is the average rate of utility price increases from Excel Energy between 2001 and 2014. Excel Energy's rates have gone up in general about 3.7% over that time period. That's actually a pretty conservative estimate. Um, many of you may have heard last week that Excel came out with a 9% um, proposed rate increase, which doesn't mean it's going to go through. I'm just using it as a counterpoint. Um, but, it, but it's more expensive, right? So if, if utility prices did go up at 9% and your, your community solar garden subscription only went up at 2.75%, and you'd be ahead, right? This is intuitive. Okay. But then you can test what you think is going to happen with utility price increases, and it shows you how much you might pay. So in this example, if, if your escalator was 2.75%, you would be making money, this is how much you'd be making per month in each of these years. So in year five, you'd be only making $2.23 a month. But in year 25, you'd be making $24.16 a month by having gone with a community solar garden subscription compared to what you would have paid to your utility otherwise. Did that just go? No. So that was good. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Does that escalator get locked in at the beginning? Uh, that's one of those things that you should look at in the term of the contract. Uh, but yes, I mean, I mean, it could be. Um, sometimes they don't, don't have... I would say that that's what I would look for. How about that? Okay, go ahead. Who's that? Is that rate uh, fixed for the term of the contract? That's that's part of what she was asking too. I would I would encourage you to look for one that would be a fixed escalator, or to ask about that if it's not that. Or I mean, I, that's one of those things to look at as you're get, looking at contracts. So this just gives you a quick sense. I'll let you um, go onto our website and play with it about sort of what that savings would look like. Because you can play with that, what that gap is based on what you think might happen with utility rates. Okay, so now you want to, you, yes? So do you have, on your website, do you have one if you didn't have the escalator and you just paid up front? You can test a 0% okay. in there and play around with it. Yes? I got to jump. Where are these solar panels located? In my house? In the big field? Oh, good. I mean, you know, yeah. we're talking about these panels. Where are they? They're, they're everywhere. <laughs> um, so, and who pays for them to put them on your house or who pays for the panels? Absolutely. So let's hit, let's hit both of those in these next two slides. Okay, so you're ready to subscribe. You want to sign up. You're, you're like, okay, great. I want to know who I could sign up with. So we have a tool that helps you actually look at what are the gardens that are available to me. And you would start by putting in here your electric utility is Excel. I want to know what's available, and I want to know eligible counties that are related to Hennepin. And it'll pop out, this is what this one is, it'll pop out which gardens are available to you to sign up, okay? And there are going to be gardens that are located on land, land mounted, or roof mounted in and around Hennepin County. Those are the things that are going to be available to you. It might be on a brown field, it might be on marginal land. It might be land on a margin of a city that the city wasn't developing. It might be at the wastewater treatment plant that the Met Council runs. It could be on a roof of a nearby business. It could be on a roof of a school. It could be a lot of those places, and that's actually one of the factors to think about when you're subscribing. Does, does it matter to you where it is? And that's actually one of the questions in your survey. Does it matter to you where it is? Does it matter to you if it's on a roof or on the ground or that kind of thing? I'm cognizant of the time. Sorry. Um, the developer is the one that's going to pay for it, but they're usually going to partner with somebody with a finance background to get that money. They're not going to pay for it typically out of pocket. They have financiers that they partner with, and many of them are trying to get their projects built before the end of 2016 when the tax credits go from 30% to 10%. But they're typically going to be using that finance money to pay for the project, and the developer may or may not install it themselves. They might hire a different installer, but all of these different players are involved in doing a project. And that's important because it means that you have to think about, as you're going into this, who do I want to work with? So the developer, the operator, is really going to be your point of contact for the community solar garden. 
So this is just a screenshot from that website that I showed you where it showed there are 13 gardens available that you could sign up for. This is a screenshot that shows four of the different developers that currently have projects listed. So one of them is Innovative Power Systems, one of them is SunShare, one is Cooperative Energy Futures, and one is Solar City. These are four of 15, 18 different solar garden operators that are working in Minnesota. Yes? So when the chart showed how many were available, those aren't necessarily built? No. None of them. No. There is. None of them are built. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really, really quick. Sorry, Jamie. Um, there have been a gigawatt or a thousand megawatts of solar gardens proposed for Excel and one 40 kilowatt system. So a megawatt is a thousand kilowatts. One 40 kilowatt system has been built. The rest of them um, are, are, are what is called in the queue. Um, and so they're being reviewed. They have to go through a whole process. All of these garden operators have to go through a process of connecting to the grid. And they have to go through a process of signing their contracts up with Excel and Excel reviews those and then Excel has to review the interconnection to make sure that they can connect safely to the grid and that there's room for those gardens on the grid. Um, and that process has taken uh, a while. Um, <laughs> yes, that is true. You will not get your investment until you are operating. But many of these are taking right now what are called either reservations or subscriptions. Could you have such a number of people Excel says no, no, you know, you've got more subscribers than you have gardens available. Sure. Um, there's, no, there's no cap on how many gardens can be built, but there may be a cap on how many are built at the time that you want to subscribe or that developers are willing to develop because of how the economics might work for them. So there could be a scenario in which, you know, like all the other tables got to subscribe, but we somehow got left out. Um, that could happen. Yes? Um, earlier you said there's a minimum of five subscribers per garden and those subscribers more than 40%. How does that fit with the idea that companies like Ecolab are doing mm -hmm. gardens themselves? So how that would work is a company like Ecolab would subscribe to a whole bunch of gardens, like they would subscribe to 50 gardens um, spread out because they could only take a share of each of those gardens, and then the rest of the garden would be subscribed by other entities. And one of the things to know is that some community solar garden developers are focusing more on those bigger institutional customers or on local governments or small businesses or that kind of thing, and some are focused more on residential. And that's not good or bad, it just is how it is. And so you should just know that going in, that there are going to be some that probably you know, are more excited about signing up residential customers than others. You, and then you, and then I should turn it over to Jamie. Go ahead. Co -op. The, big, the big boys in can we get a co op together a bunch of people who are like grocery stores? Yep, so um, actually, Cooperative Energy Futures is one of the entities that's doing development, and they actually are a co op. But there are, yeah, I mean, there are ways to do that, and there are ways to organize amongst your neighbors to participate and to do the outreach work around that and get people to subscribe together. There are tons of different options, and I'm sure that Joy and some of the other neighborhood folks would be happy to talk to you about that. I have one more back here. and. Okay. Will the output be similar from garden to garden, or will some be more efficient, some less efficient, and how do you as a consumer determine which one you want to sign up for? So you, you want to look at what those production estimates are, and you'll probably, Jamie, will you talk about this a little bit? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, you want to look at those production estimates. It will vary. I mean, it depends on the kind of panel they use and where it's sited and what the solar resource is, but it's something... But nothing's up and running, so you've got no hard data. To no, you don't. It's estimates. I mean, and they're looking, but they... But they are looking, I mean, a lot of these people who do this, many of these developers have worked in other states. So they've done this, they've run these programs, they know how to do it. If they haven't done community solar in another state, they're solar installers who have been doing solar installations in Minnesota and know how it works. It, honestly, getting a sense for what the solar resource is is not terribly complicated. You use a solar pathfinder, you go out, you measure the sun hours, and then you can look at what the production is and all the manufacturers have estimates of how efficiently their panels convert electricity and many of those are, are companies that have been manufacturing solar panels for a number of years and they have good data and good testing to go behind what their estimates say they will produce in a certain given resource 
and what they actually will produce. I, I mean, solar is an sorry, solar is a really old technology. It's not it's not brand new. It's I mean, it's still shiny and fancy and seems more exciting than putting insulation in your roof. But um, but it's it's a known it's a known entity, and you're, they will absolutely be estimates. But your your subscription is typically tied to both what the system produces. So if it doesn't produce, you are not paying. And your compensation is tied to what it produces. So you're going to be sort of no worse or better off if the system doesn't work. I mean, you might be bummed out, but, but financially, what you should be looking for in a contract is making sure that if that garden is not producing, you should not be paying in that, that pay-as-you-go that pay model. That is one of the challenges of the pay-up-front model is that if you're putting all that money down at the beginning and then it doesn't produce, what do you have as your recourse? Well, what if you get destroyed by a storm? Right. Usually, they, I mean, they're going to have insurance for that. Um, okay. the, and they have, to, they have to actually provide when they file with Excel. They have to show that they have insurance for that. I'm not just saying they should have insurance. They, they have to have insurance. They have to. And you can ask for that. That's one of the things that you should ask, ask for. And they should be showing you as part of a Public Utilities Commission filing. It's one of the things they have to show you in your subscription agreement. Okay. Oh. Janie, why don't you just come up here and I'll just hand it over to them. Come on, Janie. Yeah. All this stuff you see is on your website. Is there a comparison between the site for wind energy versus solar energy? Hmm. No. <laughs> hey, that was a short one. Um, uh, no. I, so I just say one quick thing. So, um, uh, how many of you have subscribed to WindSource? Okay. So there's there's more. That's the that's the comparison, right? So you can subscribe to WindSource. You can sign right up right now. It'll be on your bill. The difference, one thing to keep in mind, the difference between signing up for Community Solar is that. Your solar, if you sell that REC, that Renewable Energy Credit, it's helping Excel meet its state mandated goals. Green pricing or wind energy, uh, their, their legislature says you have to produce you know, 30% of your energy from renewables by 2020. And you're required to do 1.5% of your energy from solar. That's a law from the state on Excel. So if they buy those renewable energy credits from you, they're using whatever project you're a part of to meet that mandate. If you sign up for green pricing, you are requiring them to do over and above what they have to do by law to meet those goals. So you're getting more renewables, you know, in theory, but we can debate that. <laughs> okay. There's our website where you can find stuff. And now I'm going to... Should I pass it to you, no, Joy, or should I just pass it to you? I just want to let people in the back know I see, like, a handful of chairs. If you'd like to sit down, I see some in the corner here. So if you want to stumble over people's legs, please do. Um, Jamie Long has been working on community solar gardens since they were basically first announced. And Linden House has been one of the leaders in Minneapolis trying to figure out what does it look like for a neighborhood to lead the charge on community solar gardens. He is a tremendous resource. He, like Joy was referring to, has been through the trenches to try to figure out how does this system work? How does it work for our neighborhood? How does it work for the residents in our neighborhood? And will be a fantastic resource. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and speaking of tremendous resources, I know that uh, there were, I'm sure, lots of questions left, so I'll do my presentation and then we'll both be taking questions from everybody. So, uh, so I'm, I'm Jamie Long. I uh, am here wearing two hats. The first is that I am the board chair for the Linden Hills Neighborhood Council. Um, and the second is that I work with a small environmental nonprofit called Linden Hills Power and Light. And we worked to um, bring uh, the composting pilot program to Linden Hills, which is now citywide, which is very exciting. And so, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our project, but before I do, just want to get a sense of uh, what would be most helpful for this group. So how many people in this room are interested in trying to develop a solar project yourself with your neighborhood or with your nonprofit or, or faith community? Okay, that's a good number. And then how many of you are just interested in possibly subscribing to something? Okay. Good. So I'll, I'll try to touch on both a little bit then from, from uh, what we're doing. And I'm going to steal one of your slides if that's yeah, okay. Yeah. And I have more on later. 
this one. Uh, so <clears throat> about a year and a half ago, two years ago, a bunch of folks in the neighborhood were, were very interested in trying to develop a community solar garden. And so uh, we wound up getting together between uh, this small environmental nonprofit and the neighborhood council to see what we could do to come up with a project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our process, talk a little bit about the project, uh, where we are now, and then, and then take questions. So, um, so we had two goals when we set out to develop the project. The first was that we wanted to promote solar energy and clean energy. And congratulations to everybody here because I think that's why you're here too, right? You care about clean energy, you care about the environment, and that's, um, that's why you're here and that's why you're interested in doing this. Some of you maybe just be like, yeah, you know, I want to save money, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's good too. Uh, but I think that a lot of you are, are here for, for bigger reasons. Um, and then the second is that we wanted to make it as much a neighborhood project as we possibly could. And so uh, with those two goals in mind, um, we set out to try to find a developer, right? So this, is, this was our first step. Who is going to be our developer? Um, and so we knew of a few developers and we asked around to try to find uh, some additional lists and now there's some great resources out there <laughs> about all the different developers that are out there. Uh, so it'll be even easier for you. And uh, we interviewed a few, we brought them in to talk to uh, the nonprofit to Leonard Hills Power and Light and asked them what, uh, what would you offer uh, working with us, what type of a project would you be interested in doing, what are some of the rates of return you might be offering, that type of thing. Um, and we wound up... Uh, Yes. Who is the we? Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, so I was going to get into that later, but I'll do it now because that, no, that makes sense. So, uh, so Linden Hills Power and Light is the small community nonprofit, and then the neighborhood council, and we both teamed up uh, to work together. So we started this sort of joint task force because both entities were interested in it, um, which I think is helpful because I can talk a little bit about, you know, for those who are developing projects, how it looks from the nonprofit side, how it looks from the neighborhood council side. But um, the, at the end of the day, we decided that the, the nonprofit itself was going to be the lead uh, in terms of partnering directly with the developer. So that's the we in this instance. Um, and the neighborhood council, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, their main role was to um, try to help with, with financing and trying to see if there was some financial support that they could provide for the neighborhood. But that doesn't mean that's the only model. Neighborhood councils can develop projects themselves as well, and that's a, a totally legitimate approach. So, developer, who is it going to be? Well, it turned out we had a solar developer in the neighborhood. Uh, and since our goal number two was to try to make it as neighborhood focused as we possibly could, that made it pretty easy. So, uh, we signed um, a contract with a solar developer in the neighborhood called Sundial Solar. Um, they have a great track record. They've worked on projects all over the state. We felt good about them. They're a small developer, a small company. Um, but, but we felt good about them. Now, there were a lot of other great companies out there, and I think we would have probably been happy working with any of them. Uh, since they were best based in our neighborhood, we felt like we, we could go wrong. So that was, that was our first step. We worked on the developer. Second step is we had to find, where's the site going to be? Where's the host site, right? So uh, we were actually pretty engaged with the developer on trying to figure this out. We wanted to, make to see if we could make it as neighborhood-based as we could. So uh, the developer did some good work for us, you know, looked at Google Maps, flagged roofs for us that were big enough in the neighborhood where we could actually uh, potentially put <coughs> solar panels on them. Uh, and then we went out, uh, off, sometimes with them, sometimes on our own, if we, if we knew the business owner or knew, knew the roof owner. Uh, and we asked them, would you be interested in hosting a neighborhood community solar site? And so we canvassed the neighborhood. That took a little bit longer than we were expected, uh, <laughs> but, but we did it. Um, and uh, some people were very interested in solar, but not so interested in community solar. They said, hey, you know, what you're telling us is great. Uh, we'd like to do it ourselves, and we're going to take the tax credit. <laughs> and so I said, okay, fine, great. Goal number one fulfilled, more solar. Goal number two, you know, <laughs> getting into the community, not so much. So uh, that was fine. Uh, some people, we were very interested in putting it on the schools in our neighborhood. Um, that wound up. Uh, being tabled because the school board itself is looking to do, at least at this point, uh, work through um, one developer and try to do it school-wide and they weren't going to go school by school. So those were our, the biggest roofs in our neighborhood and those were checked off, unfortunately. So then we had a couple commercial nodes that we were looking at and going to talk to folks um, and we wound up having success with, with one site. So uh, for those who have been to the co-op grocery store in Linden Hills, the Linden Hills co-op, they signed on as our first site. Uh, and so we had a host site which was terrific. And uh, so uh, their roof was, uh, is big enough to hold 110 kilowatts of energy. 
which is not too bad for a commercial roof. Um, that's a, a one panel is about a kilowatt in terms of the panels that uh, this installer is, is installing. So take 110 panels up on a, a grocery store roof, right? Pretty good, pretty small neighborhood project. Uh, the host site uh, in this instance is the, is the grocery store, right? Um, the, own, the grocery store doesn't own the property, so there's a landlord involved. Uh, so the landlord uh, is going to be actually the one who's getting the, the direct benefit uh, of hosting it. In our instance, uh, the benefit that the, the solar operator, that the uh, developer is offering is they're getting 10% of the credits. Uh, so 10% of the renewable energy that's produced, that's essentially their fee for being the host site. So, uh, so that's our host site. So that means that 10%, you know, 110 shares minus 10%, we're at 99 shares. That we're able to offer to the neighborhood for this. Um, so that's our first one where we believe uh, that you know we can fill rooms like this in our neighborhood too, which is really exciting. There's a lot of lot of interest in community solar, so we're actively pursuing new host sites as well. But this is the this is the one that, that's active right now. It's hopefully, going to be our first one. Uh, financing. I'm not going to get into this too much, but uh, this was mostly taken care of by the developer from our standpoint. They had some outside financiers who were able to. Uh, monetize the tax credit. There are tax credits that are involved that make these projects much cheaper. There's a 30% federal tax credit. If you're a nonprofit, you're not really going to be able to monetize that tax credit. So often you're going to be working with outside partners to try to make sure that you're claiming the value of that tax credit because otherwise you're paying 30% more for your project and that's not going to that's not going to help, right? Um, but the financing, for the most part, uh, was taken care of by by the um, the developer. Uh, utilities Excel uh, site assessor uh, is was the developer in this case. They, they worked together. Uh, installer is also the developer. So outreach partner. So this is um, what Linden Hills Power and Light signed on to do. So our little neighborhood non nonprofit signed an agreement with the developer to be an outreach partner. And so essentially, what that means is the nonprofit said, or excuse me, the developer said, "Hey, look, we have a lot of expertise in building solar panels. We don't really have." Uh, experience working with neighborhoods to try to develop lists of subscribers and man maintain those over time, right? Uh, will you do that with us? And so we said absolutely. And so we are getting paid a small amount of money per every share that we sign up uh, to be the outreach partner. So that can be a nice source of revenue potentially for a nonprofit, for a community group uh, to try to you know do good and do well at the same time. Uh, it's it's not much money. It's not like we're going to be getting uh, you know blowing up the, the budget of our little nonprofit. But it's you know and it's nowhere near covers the amount of hours that we put into it. But it's enough that it's uh, helpful. You know it'll be a small revenue raiser for the organization. Uh, so what does that mean that we're doing? So right now we're actually in the process of taking subscribers. Uh, we which is very exciting. It's uh, taken us a long time to get there. But uh, about three weeks ago we went public. Uh, in the neighborhood, uh, we're, we're focusing on our neighborhood first with, with goal number two, trying to make sure this is as, as much of a neighborhood project as we can. So we're going out uh, to neighborhood lists, um, and we have a, a long list of people who had expressed interest previously who we're going out to, and so we're actively recruiting subscribers right now, uh, which is really exciting. And so our role as the small community nonprofit going forward is going to be to maintain that subscriber list. So um, in our partnership with the developer, we're going to be the ones who are responsible to send in the information to Excel Energy every year saying, uh, Lee, you're getting picked on because you're here, right? Uh, <laughs> Lee moved, you know, houses, uh, which is, which, so, you know, we'll have to send a some change of address or uh, Lee sold a share and so we need to update who the share was sold to, right? Those are the things that we're going to be communicating back and forth to the utility, and we'll have a small ongoing uh, uh, compensation from the developer for doing that. Uh, so, in terms of the uh, pricing, um, I can make that. I can tell you what it is because it's public. Uh, so, uh, we're selling one kilowatt share for seventeen hundred dollars. Um, it's an upfront model. It's not a pay-as-you-go model, uh, but. <laughs> There is, a, there is a slight pay-as-you-go aspect, so this is not quite, doesn't quite fit into either of the two categories that were presented earlier, uh, in that there's going to be a small uh, annual maintenance fee, which will be actual maintenance and capped at 12% of the total um, 
renewable energy production. So, uh, so that is the way that this project was designed. So there's, it's mostly up front, but there's a small annual fee that's paid as you go. Um, the, there's a nice table that uh, the developer has online of what their estimates are, how much uh, the share is going to return uh, over time, and they estimate an eight to nine year payback. So a 25 year project, eight to nine year payback, uh, meaning you're gonna get about $200 a year roughly um, in uh, payments from Excel, yeah. Are people allowed to buy more than one share? Or? So for, for our little project, for right now, we're just selling one share at a time because we want to maximize the participation. Uh, we had a lot of interest. Now, m most projects aren't going to do that. I think most projects are going to take whatever folks are willing to, to give them. Um, but that's, our, that's what we're doing right now. And our hope is that we're going to be able to get a lot more uh, sites to meet the demand of everybody and that we can go back to those folks who signed up at this point and say, hey, look, you know, you liked it before, now if you want to offset your entire energy use, you can. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'll, then I'll stop and uh, take questions, is uh, the role of the neighborhood council. Uh, so some of you, I know a lot of you here were invited through neighborhood councils or uh, might be working directly with neighborhood councils. So, um, so neighborhood councils uh, certainly can develop projects. There are, uh, we've, we found that there are some restrictions on what funding can be used in, in our conversations with the city. Um, and how they can be used, so you're going to want to have those conversations directly if, if as a neighborhood council you're interested in it. Um, but one thing that we've been trying to do as a neighborhood council is uh, help provide, um, help transition some of the upfront costs into pay-as-you-go costs, so to help folks who might not necessarily be able to afford um, a full upfront share. And so that's something we're still working on. We're hoping that if we can get it running uh, for the second project. Um, but that's that's the partnership we're trying to have between the neighborhood council and the nonprofit. So I'll stop there, and maybe if you want to come back up, and then we can take additional questions if, if we have time. Do you guys want to just cover? Sure. Yeah. So, all right. How many do you think you have in your shares? In your <coughs> Ninety-nine shares is what we've got right now. So that's how many we have available. We're in the process. I'm not going to tell you, but we're doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How long did it take for Excel to hook it up? Oh, so it, so that's a very good question. So, uh, we are we haven't even applied to Excel yet. So we're before that stage. Okay. Um, because so you we're not going to we're not going to be listed on the, the no, okay. website. We're not going to be listed on an Excel project list right now because uh, we are gathering um, small payments to reserve shares, and that is going to go to the. There's an escrow payment that you have to put in with Excel uh, when you are applying. And so uh, our developer, which is a very small developer, needed help making that escrow payment. So we're collecting those down payments from the subscribers and then the, the subscription, the application is going to go into Excel. After that point, we're hoping that it'll move pretty quickly because we're a very small project uh, and we're located in the city. So interconnection issues are going to be less than some of the outside uh, the city projects. Uh, but who knows, right? Hey, I mean, our hope reason, is six months, but. The reason I asked my file on, he was the one that was in pain over 500 pull up projects. It took them like, until the paper and article came out, to that paper like. Yeah. That was the question that I had about the tax incentive that's disappearing or reducing so much, and Excel is delaying so much on the approval of all these projects, all these developments, they've only approved one. Oh. <laughs> um, that was fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that we can do as individuals or certs can do or Linden Hills can do to encourage Excel to excel. Well, I think they want that. When that article came out about this was paper radio a couple months ago, yeah. my father in law, he got a call from the president of Excel like the next that Sunday. So. <laughs> we don't have that concept. <laughs> no, but it was all the, it was the paper article that caused everything to happen. So, it, it was on the news, it will be on the news. Um, there, I mean, there are a lot of people who, not unlike what you just described, are very concerned about that process. CERTS doesn't do any policy or advocacy work. We don't work at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, I would say that if you have questions and concerns, I would reach out to your legislators. As I mean, it's a, just a <coughs> discount that put tax instead of going from, what, 30 to 10? It's going from 30 to 10. Um, I would reach out to your legislators. I would reach out to the Public Utilities Commission. I mean, the Public Utilities Commission has an open docket, 
uh, 13-867 is the docket number. Um, and you're allowed to file as a consumer and say you have questions about how that process is going or encourage that. I mean, those are all avenues that are available to you to make comments and to work with maybe your neighborhood councils to say, is there something that we could do jointly to get involved in that process? I mean, there are always options available to you. Yeah, and, and if, you, if it sounds like the question too is on the federal tax credit, right? The 30 to 10 percent, which yeah. is happening at the end of 2016, um, and uh, so likewise, in addition to contacting the, the PUC and some of your local legislators, contact your federal representatives and let them know that you want to see um, that extended beyond 2016. And that's not a conversation that you need to have next year. That's a conversation that you should have right now because these projects are being developed right now. And as you can hear from my story, and I mean, I'm, we're, we're a small project, but it takes a long time to develop a project and you've got to do siting and you've got to go through the process with Excel. And so right now is when projects are needing to queue up to be finished, by, you know, be constructed, in, starting construction by the end of 2016. And so it, it is a, a live issue and uh, next month, uh, is when Congress is going to be considering a lot of these expiring tax provisions for 2015, and they should be thinking about some that are expiring for 2016, and so this is something that everybody should contact your member of Congress about. Minneapolis does long-term contracts with Excel, and I know that was being renegotiated. What's the status of that? They've negotiated a a 10-year franchise agreement and have now kick-started a process called the Clean Energy Partnership, I believe is what it's called. You can actually go to Excel's website and, website and get updates on it, but they've renegotiated a franchise agreement that's only a 10-year period and have kick-started this process where the community is actually engaged with Excel talking about what they want. So are there things concerning solar in there that are holding their feet to the fire to um, there are things that concern solar in there. I'm honest, I, I'm not close enough to the process. I would look primarily at their website. Okay. Yeah. Go Well, I, I don't, um, <laughs> because I don't do the installation. But yes, I mean, they, they do. And I mean, typically the developers or installers have relationships with suppliers. Um, and you should ask about whose panels are they and what are their production estimates. We, here, go ahead. Yeah, our, our project, we're using 10K Solar, which is a Minnesota uh, solar manufacturer. Um, and that goes to, I think, our, one of our values was trying to make this as community-based as possible. And so we were excited about having a Minnesota main panel, um, but there could be a trade-off if other panels are more efficient. And I'll also note that there probably are trade-offs in the fact that our project is a little bit smaller than some of the projects that are going to be built on very large fields. So I you know, certainly don't assume that our project is going to be the cheapest or the best deal. Um, so I, you know, I think that there's something where, where people should weigh values versus, you know, is your biggest value have, what, how much the return is, or are there other values you want to consider? And it's just worth asking. I mean, and you can ask them how they picked that, and do they have a track record of using those, and those are all good questions to ask. You said the roof at the grocery store, are there a co-op? Was it hard to find people, places, Yeah, I, I talked about that a little bit. Uh, it, it's, it's been, well, so we, we set ourselves a very limited goal, right, which was to find a rooftop in our neighborhood, and that there aren't that many that met the criteria. So so we had a pretty limited number. Now, um, for the other other roofs we're looking at, we're looking outside the neighborhood, um, just because we have to, you know, the, we've sort of tapped out all the options in our neighborhood. So, but uh, we were lucky that we found, we found one. We were happy about that. Yeah. I'm going to wrap things up, but you can stick around to ask them questions if you still have them. Um, I do want to tell you the door prize winners, but I also want to let you know that there are a bunch of, um, as Lisa mentioned, there are projects that will be looking for subscribers pretty aggressively. You know, do look at the terms of the contract, see if they make sense for you. The intent of the neighborhood is not to, you know, compete with those, but perhaps to organize and help evaluate, um, perhaps negotiate a group rate. 
perhaps someday end up with a new rooftop garden nearby. These are all perhapses depending on variables. So please do fill out your surveys, let us know your preferences and your interest levels and things like that. And I do want to give these door prizes away. Um, a solar powered cell phone or other device charger, two of them. Um, is Marco Soltero in the room from Diamond Lake? All right. <laughs> And then also Susan Hole. Yay! Thank you all very much for being here. Um, yeah, and have a wonderful night.